This episode is brought to you by Babbel, the language learning app. Get up to 60% off your subscription today. Babbel's lessons are scientifically proven to get you speaking a new language in as little as three weeks and are designed by real language teachers to help you learn practical conversation skills. Babbel comes with a range of different subscription models, which now includes a lifetime subscription. So whether you're aiming to master a new language entirely, or you just want to be able to say Je m'appelle Charles, Les Adichons s'il vous plaît, on your summer holiday in the south of France, Babbel has the tools for you. And judging by the ongoing odyssey of failure that is Crofty and I attempting to understand and pronounce other languages, it's help that we're definitely going to need. For example, our next episode is going to involve Old English, Irish, and possibly even some Norse pronunciations. Or, as I like to say as one of the people who's going to have to try and pronounce all of those, help. What's more is that if you sign up to Babbel today, you'll also receive two free live classes to go with your subscription. And if you're not happy, Babbel even offers a 20-day money-back guarantee. Babbel's app is easily accessible on your phone or tablet, so you can always fit in one of its lessons, even when you're on the go. So click on the link in the description to get started today. They say if you go down to the crossroads alone, and wait for that brief moment when night turns to dawn, you might see the old man sitting there. Even if you don't see him, you might smell the faint aroma of his pipe tobacco, or see the shadow of his crutch, or hear his deep, merry chuckle. Sometimes he gives you things. Sometimes he takes things from you. Only one thing is certain. Once you've gone to see him, You'll never be the same again. Well, listeners, we're back. A little bit sooner than we expected, uh, due to what I'm going to call a happy accident during the course of writing our Anansi episode, which is something we kind of mentioned a little bit, which is Anansi is far from the only trickster figure to be found both in West Africa and indeed throughout the African continent. And uh, during the course of putting together that episode, I thought it would be quite good to talk about some more of those West African tricksters, but I encountered two problems. One was that it was stretching out the episode length quite long and uh, kind of taking a bit of the focus away from Anansi himself. And also, uh, these figures are, shall we say, a little more ripe than Anansi, if such a thing could happen. I have been told by a few people at home that they, they do occasionally use the podcast episodes as like an educational resource, like kind of almost like a recommended reading thing. And uh, if you're recommending this to school children, uh, maybe not this episode, there's going to be a little bit of penis talk going on. I know there was a little bit on the Anansi episode as well, so Anansi himself having a strong sexual appetite and, uh, you know, having a bad habit of breaking his penis over and over. But um, yeah, this is a a little bit more than that. So, Crofty, who are we going to be talking about in this second mini-episode? We're going to be talking about Two other trickster figures from West Africa, Eshu and Legbar, also known as Papa Legbar. Yeah, both these figures went through something of a similar process to Anansi, with having West African origins, and uh, due to the legacy of the slave trade being transmitted to different parts of the Caribbean, far more so Legbar than Eshu. But as we'll see, Legbar's development does kind of come by way of Eshu, so you could almost argue Eshu is making a transformation there as well. So how this initially worked out is that I basically was going to cover all these sections. So in order to balance things out a little bit, Crofty's kind of gone away and uh, covered some of the sections that I originally was going to in the main episode. The result is that I'm going to be covering the figure of Eshu or Eshu Alegba, and Crofty is going to be covering the figure of Legba. But I do have a few bits and pieces that I'm going to be jumping in during their section. In terms of the sources for this little episode, I used the works Who is That Fellow in the Many Coloured Cap? Transformations of Eshu in Old and New World Mythologies by Donald Consentino. 
Uh, Anansi Eshu and Legba, Slave Resistance and the West African Trickster by Dr. Emily Zobel Marshall. The Trickster in West Africa, A Study of Mythic Irony and Sacred Delight by Robert D. Pelton. And a little bit from Eshu Elegba, The Yoruba Trickster God by John Pemberton. And I think I have another reference hidden in there as well uh, for one of the stories I'm going to be using. So I will mention that when it comes up. And for my section, I also made use of the Constantino and Zobel Marshall papers. Uh, to add to that, there was also Yoruba Influences in Haitian Voodoo and New Orleans Voodoo by Ina J. Fandrick. The book The Haitian Voodoo Handbook, Protocols for Riding with the Loa by Kenaz Philan. And I will be making a brief reference to a paper, A Meeting with the Devil at the Crossroads, a Contemporary Legend by Gail DeVos, and the book Deep Blues, A Musical and Cultural History of the Mississippi Delta by Robert Palmer. And I definitely did not get distracted reading that when I was just trying to verify a single reference, honestly. (laughs) (laughs) Me getting distracted by music? (laughs) I don't get distracted by music history at all. (laughs) No. The um, Yeah, I always have a bad habit of that where it's like, oh, uh, I'm really enjoying this particular reference. Oh, look, I've written 500 words that have no place in this episode uh, and just wasted the last half an hour. Oops. (laughs) (laughs) So to get on track, folks, I'm going to be talking about the deity of Eshu, or also known as Eshu Elegba, as I mentioned before, who is a figure of Yoruba origin. Uh, the Yoruba peoples are an ethno-linguistic group that uh, are predominantly based in modern Nigeria. Whilst Eshu has many aspects in common with Anansi, he is much more explicitly a deity. So we did discuss in the Anansi episode uh, whether or not Anansi historically was considered a god figure. Eshu also remains prominent within the Yoruba Vodun religious practices today. How's that pronounced? Yeah, I think Vodun, and then it becomes Vodou. When you get to yeah. um, New Orleans. And indeed Eshu and Eshu and indeed Eshu remains prominent within Yoruba Vodun religious practices today. Specifically, he is said to be the counterpart of Ifa, the deity of wisdom and divination. And it is through his mediation that sacrifices are offered and accepted. In line with his religious role, he acts as something of a primordial creator deity and is also considered a god of the crossroads, uh, who regulates the balance and pathways between the human world and the world of the spirits. It is for this reason that he is said to walk with a limp, as his legs are not the same length, as one of them is kept anchored in both worlds. Uh, As with Anansi, there are also strong sexual overtones to his character, most strikingly in how he is said to have a permanently erect penis, and a completely unstoppable sexual appetite. This is reflected in how sculptures of Eshu often consist of figures who are shaped like a stylized phallus that are then placed at shrines outside of homes, at the marketplace, and of course, at crossroads. As with Anansi, he is also the subject of many praise poems, or oriki, in which he is often depicted as wearing a multicolored cap the colours most commonly being red, white, and black. He is also capable of shape-shifting in ways that defy conventional ideas of gender. So, as noted by Emily Zobel Marshall, many depictions of Eshu are as either a hermaphroditic figure, holding its breasts in its hands, or as a conjoined half-male and half-female figure. As also noted by Professor Donald Consentino, He is described in various other ambiguous terms in these poems, such as the biggest creature with a big wooden stick, but also so tiny that he must stand on tiptoe in order to put salt in the soup. He's also described as the youngest of the gods, or the Orisha, but also as being the father of them all, and as one who is due the natural license and liberties of the innocent, and also the privileges of the aged. Similarly, John Pemberton describes him as large and powerful, powerful and gentle, high and low, swift and immobile, present yet absent. So in Eshu's stories, which as with the Anansi Sim, 
often concern the creation of the universe and human society, Eshu is often seen to test human society and their promises. So as an example, I would like to recap a version of the most common praise poem that I came across over the course of my research, which is an account of two friends who forgot about Eshu. The specific source of my version I've used here is the book Trickster Makes the World by Professor Hyde Lewis, uh, which contains the most elaborate version that I ran across. So once, two friends took vows of eternal friendship to one another, but neither thought to consider Eshu in their bargain. Taking note of this, Eshu decided to do something about them. When the time was ripe, he made a cloth cap, one side of which was black and one side of which was white. Uh, in another version I found one side of the cap is red, whilst the other is both blue and white. So whilst the two friends were out tilling their field, one was hoeing on the right side, and the other was clearing the bushes on the left. Eshu came riding by on a horse between the two men, so one saw only the white side, and the other saw only the black side. Later, whilst the two were taking lunch in the cool shade under the trees, one man said, Did you see the man in the white hat who greeted us as we were working? He was very pleasant, wasn't he? The other replied, Yes, he was charming, but it was a man in a black cap, I recall, not a white one. The first man was adamant, however, that it was a white cap, and soon the pair fell to arguing. Eventually they began to fight, and their neighbours came running to separate the two but the fight ended up being so ferocious that they could not be separated and seemed intent on killing each other. So uh, in some alternative versions I found uh, the fight is stopped and the pair are dragged before the local king to give an accounting of their action. In both circumstances, Eshu wanders into the midst of all this going on, looking very calm and innocent, and sternly asks, what is the cause of all the hullabaloo? The neighbours respond, Two close friends are fighting, they seem intent on killing each other, and neither would stop or tell us the reason. Please do something before they destroy each other. Eshu then asks why the men are making a spectacle of themselves. The men tell him about the man with the cap, one still swearing that it was black and the other white. Eshu then says, both of you are right, I am the man who paid the visit over which you now quarrel, and here is the cap that caused it. He produces the cap from his pocket and says, As you can see, one side is white and the other is black. You each saw one side and therefore are right about what you saw. Are you not the two friends who made vows of friendship? When you vowed to be friends always, to be faithful and true to each other, did you reckon with Eshu? Do you know that he who does not put Eshu first in all his doings has himself to blame if things misfire? And so it is said, Eshu, do not undo me, do not falsify the words of my mouth, do not misguide the movements of my feet. You who translates yesterday's words into novel utterances, do not undo me, I bear you sacrifices. On a final note about Eshu, it should be said that despite the often humorous content of some of his other praise poems, it has been noted by both Donald Consentino and uh, Robert Pelton that these tales are not greeted with laughter by the Yoruba, and that indeed his disruptive qualities inspire as much fear as it does affection amongst his followers. So in comparison to Eshu and Anansi, Legba has less of an independent origin. So Legba specifically is a trickster god of the Fon, a people who today are mostly to be found in central and southeastern Benin, along with the western edges of Nigeria. Currently, it is thought that this figure was in fact transmitted from the Yoruba people uh, as a consequence of Fon raiding parties, who in the 18th century would conduct slave raids on Yoruba areas. So, Crofty, I'm going to pass over to you now to uh, give us a bit more information on the figure of Legba. Thank you, Charles. So, in the Vodun religion of the Fon people, Legbar's role has some similarities to that of Anansi, in that he acts as a mediator between the worlds of the human and the divine. However, he also has the role of mediator between individual gods themselves, 
and unlike Anansi, he is considered to be one of the gods. Legbar's origin is as the seventh and the youngest child of the ruler of the Vodun pantheon, Maulisa. Maulisa was an androgynous deity, and in their predominantly female aspect of Mawu, she birthed six other gods to whom she gave mastery over specific aspects of the world. However, by giving each child their own dominion, and Maulisa being the ruler of heaven, that meant that each of them spoke a different language, because to the Fon, language and story was what bound the world together, and so to rule each domain of the world required its own language. Legbar, as the youngest child, was given no domain, but he would not be under the authority of any of his brothers. Instead, Mawu kept him with her, granting him the gift of speaking all languages and tasking him with acting as the mediator. Any god who wished to address Mawu Lisa must instead speak to Legbar, but none of them knew the language to speak to their mother. Because of this, the image of Legbar appeared before the houses of all of the Vodun gods, for humans or gods must address Legbar first before addressing the gods, and for this he became known as the Divine Linguist. As well as the Divine Linguist, he also had a role in the divination of the future, which I believe, Charles, you have a little more information on. Yes, I did actually get a little bit more information from this. So there are three great myths amongst the Fon, which uh, explain the origin of Far or divination, and in one of these, Legber plays quite a pivotal role. So according to Robert Pelton, uh, the power of divination springs forth from a primordial god known as Gabadu, who is also Mawu's child, and whom they set upon a palm tree to observe the earth, the sea, and the sky. Whilst Gabadu has 16 eyes, she cannot open them herself, so each morning Legba would do so. To prevent other people from overhearing, when he asks her which eyes she wished to open, she hands him one palm kernel if she wishes two eyes opened, and two if she wishes only one. Later, after Gabadu has given birth to children, Legba reports to Mawu that war is raging around the world as men do not know how to behave. Ignoring Legba's suggestion that Gabadu be sent to men in order to teach them the language of Mawu, Mawu instead decrees that three of Gabadu's sons be sent to each of the great kingdoms of men. Mawu gives Gabadu a house with 16 doors corresponding to her eyes that are said to represent the keys of the future, and orders that whilst Legba will be the inspector of the world, Gabadu and her sons will be the intermediaries between Mawu and the three kingdoms. Gabadu's sons then teach men that in order to know the future, they should play palm kernels at random, which would open an eye of Gabadu and a corresponding door in the house of the future. All right, back to you then, Crofty. In West Africa, depictions of Legbar show him in human form, unlike Anansi. He's always depicted as a young and playful and quite bawdy man. He is a master of music. He, he was the only god who was granted musical abilities by Mau Lisa, and he is also a dancer who is described as dancing in the manner of copulating. So it was all I mentioned on in my notes on that, but I believe you again had a little bit more to jump in with, Charles. Yeah, so there is um, another myth that again explains this aspect of Legba, in particular his permanently erect penis and his dance like a man copulating. So again, according to Robert Pelton, Legba slept with both Gabadu and her daughter Minona, who was the goddess of women. One day, whilst Legba and Gabadu were away visiting the earth and were sharing a sleeping mat, Legba snuck away in order to have sex with Minona. Gabadu, however, follows and catches the two, and they return to Mawu to allow them to judge the case. Legba denies that he was sleeping with Minona but Mawu orders him to undress. This reveals him to be, quote, with phallus rampant, which I think is a, a fantastic turn of phrase, <laughs> and Mawu accuses him of lying to her and of deceiving Gabadu. As punishment, Mawu orders that Legba will remain erect always and that his sexual appetite will never be satisfied. 
Legba then begins to play, in air quotes, with Gabadu, and when his parent reproaches him, he points out that it was they who made him insatiable. Thus it came to be that Legba acquired his distinctive dance and his lust for any nearby woman. So that story explains how Legba came to embody male sexual potency. As well as this, he does also have more destructive aspects. Although through these destructive aspects, he does still go on to encourage a new creation and new life through conflict. So the other of the creation myths featuring Legba um, focuses instead on his proclivity for resolving conflict through destructive means. And this is the story of how the earth and sky came to be linked. Initially, the domains of each god were separate. And so the domain of the earth god Sagbata was dry and lifeless, while the domain of the sky god Hevioso contained all the world's water. The agreement was that the water would be sent from the sky god's domain to earth. However, a quarrel ensued between Hevioso and Sagbata, which caused Hevioso to refuse to send water to earth. This conflict was in fact started by Legba, who initially told Hevioso that there would be no water left in the sky because the earth would take it all. And Maulisa despaired at the way that her children were acting, but could do nothing to resolve it. Legba would then go on to resolve this conflict, or to force a resolution, more correctly. He would convince Sagbata to light a fire so great that it would burn the sky as well as the earth. So Mawu, fearing for both of their children, commanded Hevioso to let the rain fall, put the fire out. And after this, because the destructive force of fire on earth needed to be balanced by water from the sky, Mawu forced the two opposing forces to be linked, creating an environment ripe for life. It was this combination of a destructive nature and a lust for life together that made the West African image of Legba what he is. The first musician, a dancer, a magician, an acrobat, and in fact the god who brought both death and medicine to the world. He was thought to reside at the crossroads between both worlds, dancing across the barriers between the physical and the spiritual at will, and so as well as creating new life, he also stood at the passage into death. As a, a final note that I had here on Legba in West Africa, to kind of compare his role to Eshu a little bit, I will say that despite being a capricious character who is known for undertaking many destructive acts, he is also presented as an agent of reconciliation between this world and the next, and aids in restoring balance between the two. As such, he is often presented as a more playful and much less vengeful entity than Eshu, and his dancing and his antics in his stories are very clearly meant to be laughed at. So, much as with Anansi in Jamaica, Eshu, and especially Legba, were also transmitted by West African slaves to different parts of the Caribbean during the slave trade. So, a very brief line on Eshu, in Brazilian plantations, for example, Yoruba slaves would represent Eshu as something of a brutal liberator figure, even more so than Anansi, uh, who killed, poisoned, and drove their enslavers mad. By comparison, however, Legba underwent a dramatically different transformation than either Anansi or Eshu in, uh, in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, and Crofty, I think you're going to go into that now. Yes, thank you. So, slaves that were taken from what's now Western Nigeria and Benin would largely be taken or bought by the French and shipped to the colonies of San Domingue, which is now the Republic of Haiti, and the colony of Louisiana. Unlike the Akanashanti people, these people were able to maintain their religion of Vodun in the Caribbean. This was in spite of the efforts of their French masters to Christianize them, as all slaves were forcibly baptized within eight days of their arrival in San Domingue. All that this did, however, was lead to the practice of Odun in secret, hidden under the appearance of Christianity. And so for this, Legba was equated with the figure of St. Michael or St. Peter. The sign of the cross, while obviously being a Christian symbol to the French, 
was instead used as Legbar's symbol, indicating his position at the crossroads between worlds. He maintained his role as the intermediary between the humans and the gods, and Vodun prayer and ceremony would always begin with a call to Legbar to remove the barrier for me so that I may pass, and in this way he allowed the spirits known as the Loar to manifest. However, the Legbar that the Fon people knew was no more. He was no longer described or depicted as being young and energetic, or as a sexual creature, or given to dance and play pranks. Instead, he took on the appearance of a weak and crippled old man, renamed Papa Legbar. He would generally be depicted with a cane, as bald and thin, smoking a pipe, and with sores all over his body. He supposedly forgot how to play tricks, he couldn't dance, and he even struggled to maintain control of the traffic across the crossroads. His role as a fertility god was lost simply by no longer having a need for one, as the slaves in Haiti had no land of their own to keep fertile. He was respected as an elder, he was given offerings according to his station, of rum, of tobacco, or of candy, and his way with words was still intact, but others needed to take on the roles that he physically could not do. So, two figures would develop to take on some of Legbar's roles that were not born from a single African mythology, but can be considered New World Creole gods, which took aspects from many of the cultures that were mixed together in the Caribbean. The first of these is Carrefour, which, forgive my pronunciation, is French for crossroads. Carrefour became the opposite of all that Papa Legbar was. He embodied the vitality that Legbar lost. He was depicted with strong muscular arms and also with a large phallus. He was often depicted standing in the pose of a cross with his arms out straight either side of him, and he was said to have taken over guarding the crossroads from Papa Legbar during the night. His role was quite limited, however, in that he represented a desire for a new freedom and for the vitality that the slaves would one day regain, and so he didn't truly fulfil the trickster role. The trickster role would instead be taken on by a second new figure, Geed. Geed would become the god of the dead, and the lord of the underworld, waiting at the crossroads to take souls to the other side. He would be dressed as an undertaker, wearing a top hat and a frock coat, and would often wear sunglasses with a single lens, so that through these he could look into both worlds at once. He would speak with a very nasal voice, he would use riddles and innuendo and double entendre in order to outwit his adversaries, and much like a Nancy, he would be a fixture of stories of the oppressed outwitting stronger foes. His stories, like Anansi's, would also inspire acts of defiance and protest. Here, though, the resistance had the Voduan religion, now called Vodou, behind it. Vodou priests and servitors said to be manifesting the spirits of the Loa, which included Papa Legbar and Gide, would be directly inciting revolt, inspiring acts of sabotage, and would convince many slaves to escape and to join communities of Maroons who were escaped slaves, who maintained mostly autonomous communities deep in the forests where the white settlers wouldn't go. Many leaders of these maroon communities were Vodou priests themselves, and some sources describe a Vodun ritual by a maroon priest named Baukman as being the first call to arms of the Haitian Revolution in 1791 which would begin the 13-year war for Haiti's independence, although that account is disputed. Papa Legbar and Guide would also migrate to Louisiana while it was a French colony, as slaves were traded between San Domingue and New Orleans. Here, fewer slaves were of Fon origin, and traits of other African religions mixed with Vodun to form New Orleans voodoo. Papa Legbar and Gide kept much of their roles here, and their appearances as a young man and an old man, in frock coats and top hats, smoking and wearing sunglasses, 
would become strongly associated with the popular idea of voodoo, which to this day is used to separate tourists from their money. Voodoo, or voodoo as spelled V-O-D-O-U, is still practiced in Haiti and in parts of Louisiana today. The independent Haiti would go on to adopt Catholicism as their official religion and would force voodoo underground. The secretive nature of voodoo and its history as a religion of resistance did lead to some media creating quite villainous stereotypes, similar to the ones that we see imposed on paganism and witchcraft, giving voodoo the aspects of devil worship and curses, becoming the voodoo that many people will know from popular media. However, after Haitian independence and these changes to voodoo, Papa Legbar does also seem to have regained some of his power. Sources such as the Haitian Vodou Handbook, which I quoted at the beginning of this episode, describe him as being able to grant luck at gambling, or to grant artistic or musical skills, if you make the correct offerings to him at a crossroads. The famous story of the blues musician Robert Johnson making a deal with the devil at the crossroads originally said that he made a deal with Papa Legbar, hmm. and there's been a lot of analysis of his music looking for voodoo themes and discussion of Papa Legbar in his lyrics. And while many people in the media have made connections between voodoo and devil worship or seen it as evil, many people do in fact practice both voodoo and Catholicism, seeing the spirits of the Loa as complementary to a supreme god. And so, whether practiced as a part of Christianity, or as a distinct religion in its own right, the practices of Vodou or Voodoo focus on communing with the Loar for wisdom. Vodou teachings say that there are over a thousand Loar, each with different personalities and domains, and who a practitioner may commune with varies wildly, but still, they always begin by asking that Papa Legbar open the gate. And that seems like an appropriate place to leave things for this episode. Indeed. So I would, at this point, pull out old trick and say, hey, Crofty, what are we talking about on our next mini-episode? But such is the way of mini-episodes that we don't know when one will, one will crop up for us. Yeah, they just sort of happen as we find something to add a bit more, add a bit more detail to. Yeah, usually what happens is, as we discussed earlier, like when one of us goes off wildly and it's like, oh, actually, this other thing is kind of interesting as well. Uh, as we saw with the yokai uh, mini episode we did that was just an audio only thing. But uh, we'll see. This one may well become a YouTube thing because I think it adds a, a kind of an extra element rather than just being us sat around going, I like this yokai. Do you like that yokai? <laughs> that was still a fun episode, though. I enjoyed it. Yeah, it was fun for us at least yeah hopefully the audience <laughs> all right folks thank you for listening take care and uh if you want to know what we're going to be doing next time go and uh, listen to the Anansi episode as always all right thank you and uh goodbye bye <laughs>